One fish, two fish. Red fish, blue fish. By Dr. Zeus. One fish, two fish. Red fish, blue fish. Black fish, blue fish. Old fish. New fish. This one has a little star. This one has a little car. Say, what a lot of fish there are. Yes, some are red and some are blue. Some are old and some are new. Some are sad and some are glad. And some are very, very bad. Oh, man. Why are they sad and glad and bad? I do not know. Go ask your dad. Some are thin and some are fat. The fat one has a yellow hat. From there to here, from here to there. Funny things are everywhere. Here are some who like to run. They run for fun in the hot, hot sun. Oh me, oh my. Oh me, oh my. What a lot of funny things go by. Some have two feet and some have four. Some have six feet and some have more. But where do they come from? I can't say, but I bet they have come a long, long way. We see them come, we see them go. Some are fast and some are slow. And some are high and some are low. Not one of them is like another. Don't ask us why, go ask your mother. Say, look at his fingers. One, two, three. How many fingers do I see? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. He has eleven? Eleven? This is something new. I wish I had eleven too. Bump, bump, bump. Did you ever ride a wump? We have a wump with just one hump. But we know a man called Mr. Gump. Mr. Gump has seven hump wump. So? So if you like to go bump, bump, just jump on the hump of the wump of Gump. Who am I? My name is Ned. I do not like my little bed. This is no good. This is not right. My feet stick out of bed all night. And when I pull them in, oh dear, my head sticks out of bed up here. We like our bike. It is made for three. Our mic sits up in the back, you see. We like our mic, and this is why. Mike does all the work when the hills get high. Hello there, Ned. How do you do? Tell me, tell me, what is new? How are things in your little bed? What is new? Please tell me, Ned. I do not like this bed at all. A lot of things have to come to call. A cow, a dog, a cat, a mouse. Oh, what a bed. Oh, what a house. Oh dear, oh dear. I cannot hear. Will you please come over near? Will you please look in my ear? There must be something there I fear. Say, look, a bird was in your ear, but he is out, so have no fear. 
Again, your ear can hear, my dear. My hat is old, my teeth are gold. I have a bird I like to hold. My shoe is off, my foot is cold. My shoe is off, my foot is cold. I have a bird I like to hold. My hat is old, my teeth are gold. And now my story is all told. We took a look, we saw a look. On his head, he had a hook. On his hook, he had a book. On his book was how to cook. We saw him sit and try to cook. He took a look at the book on the hook. But Nook can't read, so Nook can't cook. So, what's good to a Nook is a hook cookbook. The moon was out and we saw some sheep. We saw some sheep take a walk in their sleep. The light of the moon by the light of a star. They walked all night from near to far. I would never walk. I would take a car. I do not like this one so well. All he does is yell, yell, yell. I will not have this one about. When he comes in, I put him out. This one is quiet as a mouse. I like to have him in the house. At our house we open cans. We have an open to many cans. And this is why we have a Zans. A Zans for cans is very good. Have you a Zans for cans? You should. I like to box. How I like to box. So every day I box a gox. In yellow socks, I box my gox. I box in yellow gox box socks. It's fun to sing. If you sing with a ying, my ying can sing like anything. I sing high and my ying sings low and we not too bad, you know. This one, I think, is called a yink. He likes to wink. He likes to drink. He likes to drink and drink and drink. The thing he likes to drink is ink. The ink he likes to drink is pink. He likes to wink and drink pink ink. So... If you have a lot of ink, then you should get a ink, I think. Hop, hop, hop. I am a yop. All I like to do is hop. From fingertop to fingertop. I hop from left to right. And then, hop, hop, I hop right back again. I like to hop all day and night. From right to left and left to right. Why do I like to hop, hop, hop? I do not know. Go ask your pop. Brush, 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 brush. Comb, 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 comb. Blue hair is fun to brush and comb. All girls who like to brush and comb should have a pet like this at home. Who is this pet? Say, he is wet. You never yet met a pet, I bet. As wet as a let's wet pet gets. Did you ever fly a kite in bed? Did you ever walk with ten cats on your head? Did you ever milk this kind of cow? Well, we can do it. We know how. If you never did, you should. 
These things are fun, and fun is good. Hello, hello? Are you there? Hello? I called you up to say hello. I said hello. Can you hear me, Joe? Oh, no. I cannot hear your call. I cannot hear your call at all. This is not good, and I know why. A mouse has cut the wire. Goodbye. From near to far, from here to there, funny things are everywhere. These yellow pets, they are called a Z. They have one hair upon their heads. Their hair grows fast. So fast, they say, they need to cut a hair every day. Who am I? My name is Ish. On my hand, I have a dish. I have a dish to help me wish. When I wish to make a wish, I wave my hand with a big swish swish. Then I say, I wish for fish. And I get fish right on my dish. So, if you wish to wish a wish, you may swish for fish with my ish wish dish. At our house, we play out back. We play a game called the Ring the Gag. Would you like to play this game? Come down. We have the only gag in town. Look what we found in the park in the dark. We will take this home. We will call him Kark. He will live at our house. He will grow and grow. Will our mother like this? We don't know. And now, good night. It is time to sleep. So we will sleep with our pets sleeping. The day is gone. Today was fun. Tomorrow was another one. Every day, from here to there, funny things are everywhere. Oh, the places you'll go by Dr. Zeus. Congratulations! Today is your day. You're off to great places. You're off and away. You have brains in your head. You have feet in your shoes. You can see yourself any direction you choose. You're on your own and you know what you know. And you are the guy who will decide where to go. You'll look up and down streets, look them over with care. About some you will say, I don't choose to go there. With your head full of brains and your shoes full of feet, you're too smart to go down any not so good streets. And you may not find any you'll want to go down. In that case, of course, you'll head straight out of town. It's opener there, in the wild open air. Out there, things can happen, and frequently do, to people as brainy and footsy as you. And when things start to happen, don't worry, don't stew. Just go right along, you'll start happening too. Oh, the places you'll go. You'll be on your way up. You'll be seeing great sights. You'll join the high flyers who soar to high heights. You won't lag behind because you'll have the speed. 
We'll pass the whole gang and you'll soon take the lead. Wherever you'll fly, you'll be the best of the best. Wherever you go, you'll top all the rest. Expect when you don't, because sometimes you won't. I'm sorry to say so, but sadly it's true that bang-ups and hang-ups can happen to you. You can get all hung up in a prickly perch and your gang will fly on and you'll be left in a lurch. You'll come down from the lurch with an unpleasant bump and the chances are then that you'll be in a slump. And when you're in a slump, you're not in for much fun. And slumping yourself is not easily done. You will come to a place where the street's not marked. Some windows are lighted, but mostly they're darked. A place you could sprain both your elbow and chin. Do you dare to stay out? Do you dare to go in? How much can you lose? How much can you win? And if you go in, should you turn left or right? Or right and three quarters? Or maybe not quite? Or go around back and sneak in from behind? Simple it's not, I'm afraid you will find, for a mind maker upper to make up his mind. You can get so confused that you'll start into race, down long wiggled roads at breaknecking pace. And grin on for miles across weirdish wild space, headed, I fear, towards a most useless place. The waiting place. For people just waiting. Waiting for a train to go, or a bus to come, or a plane to go, or the mail to come, or the rain to go. Or the phone to ring, or the snow to snow or waiting around for a yes or no, or waiting for the hair to grow. Everyone is just waiting. Waiting for the fish to bite, or waiting for the wind to fly a kite, or waiting around for Friday night, or waiting perhaps for their Uncle Jake, or a pot to boil, or a better break, or a string of pearls, or a pair of pants, or a wig with curls, or another chance. Everyone is just waiting. No, that's not for you. Somehow you'll escape, and all that waiting and staying, you'll find the bright places where boom bands are playing. With the banner flip-flapping, once more you'll ride high, ready for anything under the sky. Ready because you're that kind of guy. Oh, the places you'll go. There is a fun to be done. There are points to be scored, there are games to be won. And the magical things you can do with the ball will make you the winningest winner of all. Fame. You'll be famous as famous can be, with the whole wide world watching you win on TV. Except when they don't. Because sometimes they won't. I'm afraid that sometimes You'll play lonely games too. Games you can't win, because you'll play against you. All 
alone, or whether you like it or not. Alone will be something you will be quite a lot, and when you're alone, there is a very good chance you'll meet things that scare you right out of your pants. There are some down the road between hither and yon that can scare you so much you won't want to go on. But on you will go through the weather be foul. On you will go through your enemies prowl. On you will go through the hack and cracks howl. Onward up many frightening creek. Through the arms you may soar and your sneakers may leak. On and on you will hike, and I know you'll hike far and face up to your problems, whatever they are. You'll get mixed up, of course, as you already know. You'll get mixed up with many strange birds as you go. So be sure when you step, step with care and great tact, and remember that life's a great balancing act. Just never forget to be dexterous and deft, and never mix up your right foot with your left. And will you succeed? Yes, you will indeed. Ninety-eight and three quarters percent guaranteed. Kid, you'll move mountains. So be your name, Buxbaum or Bixie or Bray, or Mordecai Ali Van Allen O'Shea. You're off to great places. Today is your day. Your mountain is waiting. So get on your way. The Sneeches by Dr. Zeus. Now the star belly snitches had bellies with stars. The plain belly snitches had none upon stars. The stars weren't so big, they were really so small. You might think such a thing wouldn't matter at all. But because they had stars, all the star belly snitches would brag. We're the best kind of snitches on the beaches. With their snoots in the air, they would sniff and they'd snort. We have nothing to do with the plain belly sort. <laughs> and when they met some and they were out walking, they'd <laughs> hike right past them without <laughs> even talking. When the star belly children went out to play ball, could a plain belly get in the game? Not at all. You could only play if your bellies had stars, and the plain belly children had none upon stars. When the star belly snitched had frankfurters roast, or picnics, or parties, or marshmallow toast. They never invited the plain belly snitches. They left them out cold in the dark of the beaches. They kept them away, never let them come near, and that's how they treated them year after year. Then one day it seems, while the plain belly snitches were mopping and dopping alone on the beaches. Just sitting there, wishing their bellies had stars. A stranger zipped up in the strangest of cars. My friend, he announced in a voice clear and keen. My name is Sylvester McMonkey McBean. And I've heard of your troubles, I've heard you're unhappy. But I can fix that, I'm the fix-it-up chappy. I've come here to help you. I have what you need, and my prices are low, and my work is at great speed, and my work is one hundred percent guaranteed. 
Then quickly, Sylvester McMonkey McBean put together a very peculiar machine. And then he said, "You want stars like a star belly snitch? My friends, you can have them for three dollars each." Just pay me your money and hop right aboard. So they clambered inside, and the big machine roared, and it clonked, and it bonked, and it jerked, and it burked, and it bopped them out. But the thing really worked. When the plain belly sneeches popped out, they had stars. They actually did. They had stars upon stars, and they yelled at the ones who had stars at the start. We're exactly like you. You can't tell us apart. We're all the same now, you snooty old smarties. Now we can go to your Frankfurter parties. Good grief! When the ones who had stars at the first were still the best snitches, and they are the worst. But now, how in the world will we know? They all frowned. If which kind is what, or the other way round? Then came McBean, the very sly wink, and he said. Things are not as quite as bad as you think. So you don't know who's who. That's perfectly true. But come as me, friends. Do you know what I'll do? I'll make you again the best snitches on beaches, and it will only cost you. It's ten dollars each. Belly stars are no longer in style," said McBean. "What you need is a trip to my star off machine. This wonderful contraption can take off your stars, so you won't look like snitches who have them on bars. And that handy machine, working very precisely, removed all the stars from their tummies quite nicely." Then, with snoots in the air, they paraded about, and they opened their beaks, and they let out a shout. We know who is who. Now there isn't a doubt. The best kind of snitches are snitches without. Then, of course, those of stars got all frightfully mad. To be wearing a star now was frightfully bad. Then, of course, old Sylvester McMonkey McBean invited them into the star off machine. Then, of course, from then on, as you probably guess, things really got into a horrible mess. All the rest of that day, on those wild screaming beaches. The fix-it-up chappy kept fixing up snitches, off again, on again, in again, out again. Through the machines they raced around about again, changing their stars every minute or two. They kept paying money. They kept running through until neither the plane nor the star bellies knew. Wherever this one was, that one. Well, that one was this one. Well, which one was what one? Well, what one was who? Then, when every last cent of their money was spent, the fixes up chappy packed up and he went. And he laughed as he drove in his car up the beach. They will never learn. No, you can't teach a snitch. But McBean was quite wrong. I'm quite happy to say that the Sneetches got really quite smart on that day. That day they decided that Sneetches are Sneetches, and no kind of Sneetch is the best on the beaches. 
That day, all the snitches forgot about stars, and whenever they had one or not upon Thars. Yertle the Turtle by Dr. Zeus. On a faraway island of Salamasson, Yertle the Turtle was the king of the pond. A nice little pond. It was clean. It was neat, and the water was warm. There was plenty to eat. The turtles had everything turtles might need, and they were all happy, quite happy indeed. They were until Yertle, the king of them all, decided the kingdom he ruled was too small. I'm ruler. Said Yertle, of all that I see, but I don't see enough. That's a trouble with me. With this stone for a throne, I look down on my pond, but I cannot look down on the places beyond. This throne that I sit on is too low, too low down. It's owed to be higher, he said with a frown. If I could sit higher, how much greater I'll be! What a king! I'll be a ruler of all I could see. So Yertle the Turtle King lifted his hand, and Yertle the Turtle King gave a command. He ordered nine turtles to swim to his stone, and using these turtles, he built a new throne. He made each turtle stand on another one's back, and he piled them all up in a nine turtle stack. And then Yertle climbed up. He sat down on the pile. What a wonderful view! He could see most a mile. Oh mine! Yertle cried. Oh, the things I now rule! I'm king of a cow and I'm king of a mule. I'm king of a horse, and what's more beyond that, I'm king of a blueberry bush and a cat. I'm Yertle the Turtle. Oh, marvelous me! For I am the ruler of all that I see. And. Through that morning, he sat there up high, saying over and over, "A great king am I." Until long about noon, then he hid a faint sigh. "What's that?" snapped the king, and he looked down the sack, and he saw at the bottom a turtle named Mac. Just a part of his throne, and this plain little turtle looked up and he said, "Beg your pardon, King Yertle. I have pains in my back and my shoulders and knees. How long must me stand here, Your Majesty? Please." Silence! The king of the turtles barked back, "I'm the king, and you're the only turtle named Mac." You stay in your place while I sit here and rule. I'm the king of a cow, and I'm king of a mule. I'm king of a horse and a bush and a cat. But that isn't all. I'll do better than that. My throne shall be higher. His royal voice thundered. So I pile up more turtles. I want about two hundred turtles. More turtles! He bellowed and brayed, and the turtles way down in the pond were afraid. They trembled, they shook, but they came, they obeyed. From all over the pond. They came swimming by the dozens, whole families of turtles with uncles and cousins, and they all of them stepped on the head of poor Mac. One after another, they climbed up the stack. Then, 
Yes, on the turtle was perched up so high he could see forty miles from his throne in the sky. Hooray! shouted the turtle. I'm king of the trees, I'm king of the birds, and I'm king of the bees. I'm king of the butterflies, king of the air. Ah oh, me, what a throne, what a wonderful show. And yes, on the turtle. A marvelous me, for I am the ruler of all that I see. And again from below, in the grave heavy stack, came a groan from the pain little turtle named Mac. Your Majesty, please, I don't like to complain, but down here below we are feeling great pain. I know upon top you are seeing great sights, but down at the bottom we too should have rights. We turtles can't stand it, our shells will all crack. Besides, we need food, we are starving, groaned Mac. You hush your mouth, howled the mighty King Turtle. You've no rights to talk to the world's highest turtle. I roar from the clouds, over land, over sea. There's nothing, no nothing that's higher than me. But while he was shouting, he saw with surprise that the moon over the evening was starting to rise up over his head in the darkening skies. What's that? snorted Yeto. Say, what is that thing that dares to be higher than Yeto the king? I shall not allow it. I'll go higher still. I'll build my throne higher. I can and I will. I'll call some more turtle. I'll stack him to heaven. I need about 5,607. But as yet all the turtle king lifted his hand and started to order and give the command. That pain little turtle below in the stack, that pain little turtle whose name was just Mac, decided he'd taken enough and he had. And a plain little lad got a little bit mad. And that plain little Mac, he did a plain little thing. He burped and his burp shook the throne of the king. <coughs> What's that? The the turtle, the king of the trees, the king of the air, the king of the birds and the bees, the king of the house, the king of the cow and the mole. Well, that was the end of the king's turtle rule. For Yertel the king of all Selimason fell of his high throne and fell plunk in the pond. And today the great Seattle, that marvellous he, is the king of the mud, that is all he can see. And the turtles, of course, all the turtles are free, as turtles and maybe all creatures should be. Horton, here's a hill. On the 15th of May, in the jungle of Nool, in the heat of the day, in the cool of the pool, he was splashing, enjoying the jungle's great joy, when Horton the elephant hears a small noise. So Horton stopped splashing. He looked towards the sound. That's funny, thought Horton. There's no one around. 
Then he heard it again, just a very faint yelp, as if some tiny person were calling for help. I'll help you, said Horton. But who are you? Where? He looked and he looked. He could see nothing there, but just a small speck of dust blowing past through there. I say, murmured Horton, I've never heard tell of a small speck of dust that is able to yell. So, you know what I think? Why, I think that there must be someone on top of that small speck of dust. Some sort of creature of very small size, too small to be seen by an elephant's eyes. Some poor little person who's shaking with fear that will be blown in a pool. He has no way to steer. I'll just have to save him because, after all, a person's a person, no matter how small. So gently and using the greatest of care, the elephant stretched his great trunk through the air. And he lifted the dust speck and carried it over and placed it down safe on a very soft clover. Ha! Humped a voice. T'was a sound kangaroo. And the young kangaroo in her pouch said, Ha! Too. Why, that speck is as small as a head of a pin. A person of that, why there has never been. Believe me, said Horton, I'll tell you sincerely, my ears are quite keen, and I hear him quite clearly. I know there's a person down there, and what's more, quite likely there's two, even three, even four. Quite likely. A family, for all that we know. A family with children just starting to grow. So please, Watson said, as a favour to me, try not to disturb them. Just please let them be. I think you're a fool, laughed the sour kangaroo. And the young kangaroo in the pouch said, Me too. You're the biggest brave fool in the jungle of Noor. And the kangaroo is plunged in the cool of the pool. What terrible splashing! The elephant frowned. I can't let my very small persons get drowned. I've got to protect them. I'm bigger than they. So he plucked up the clover and hustled away. Through the high jungle treetops, the news quickly spread. He talks to a dust bag. He's out of his head. Just look at him walk with that speck on that flower. And horse had a walk to worry in almost an hour. Should I put this speck down? Horton thought with alarm. If I do, these small persons may come to great harm. I can't put it down. And I won't. After all, a person's a person, no matter how small. Then Horton stopped walking. The speck voice was talking. The voice was so faint, he could barely hear it. Speak up, please, said Horton. He put his ear near it. My friend, came the voice. Your very fine friend. You've helped us all folk of this dustbag no end. You've saved our, all our houses, our ceilings and floors. You've saved our churches and our grocery stores. You mean? Horton gasped. Your buildings are too? Oh yes, 
piped the voice. We must certainly do. I know, called the voice. I'm too small to be seen. But I'm the mayor of a town that is friendly and clean. Our buildings to you would seem terribly small, but to us who aren't big, they're wonderfully tall. My town is called Whoville, for I am a Who, and we Whos are all thankful and grateful to you. And Horton called back to the mayor of the town. You're safe now. Don't worry. I won't let you down. But just as he spoke to the mayor of the speck, three big jungle monkeys climbed up Horton's neck. The Wickersham brothers came shouting, "What rot! This elephant's talking to his who are not." They aren't any hoos, and they don't have a mouth. And we're going to stop all this nonsense. So there. <coughs> they snatched Horton's clover and carried it off to a black bombed eagle named Vlad Vlad Ekov, a mighty strong eagle, a very swift wing. And they said, "Will you kindly get rid of this thing?" And before the poor elephant even could speak, that eagle flew off with a flower in his beak. <laughs> All that late afternoon and far into the night, that black-bottomed bird flapped his wings in first flight. While Horton chased after groans over stones. That tattered his toenails and battered his bones and begged, "Please don't harm all my little fox. We have much right to live, as us bigger fox do." But far beyond him, that eagle kept flapping, and over his shoulders kept back, "Quit your yapping! I fly through the night through, and I'm a bird. I don't mind it." I'll hide this tomorrow, where you'll never find it. And six fifty-six the next morning, he did it. It sure was a terrible place that he hid it. He let that small clover drop somewhere inside. Of a great patch of clovers, a hundred miles wide. Find that," sneered the bird. "But I think you'll fail." And he left with a flip of his black bottom tail. <laughs> I'll find it," cried Horton. "I'll find it or bust." I shall find my friends on that small speck of dust. Clover by clover, by clover of care,、hmm. he picked up, searched them, and called, "Are you there?" But clover by clover, by clover, he found the one that he sought for was just not、oh. around. And noon, poor old Horton, more dead than alive,、oh. had picked, searched, and piled up nine thousand and five. Then, on through the afternoon, hour after hour, till he found them at last on the three millionth flower. My friends. Cried the elephant. Tell me, do tell. Are you safe? Are you sound? Are you whole? Are you well? From down of the speck came the voice of the mayor. We really had trouble, much more than our share. When the black button birdie let go and dropped, we landed so hard that our clocks have stopped. Our teapots are broken. Our rocking chair smashed, and our bicycle tires all blew up when we crashed. So 
so wholesome, please. Pleaded that voice of the mess. Will you stick by us, Hoos, while we're making repairs? Of course, Horton answered. Of course I will stick. I'll stick by you small folks through thin and through thick. Humph, the voice. For almost two days, you've run wild and it's dead, or chatting with persons who've never existed. Such carrying on in a peaceable jungle, we've had quite enough of your bellowing bungle. And I'm here to state snapped the big kangaroo. <laughs> that your silly nonsensical game is all through. And the young kangaroo in her pouch said, Me too. <laughs> With the help of Wickersham brothers and dozens of Wickersham uncles and Wickersham cousins and Wickersham in-laws have helped and engaged, you're going to be ruined and you're going to be caged. As for your dust speck, huh, that will shall boil in a hot steamy kettle of basil nut oil. Boil it? gasped Horton. Oh, that you can't do. It's a full of purses. They'll prove it to you. <laughs> Mr. Mayor, Mr. Mayor, Horton called. Mr. Mayor. You've got to prove now that you really are there. So call a big meeting, get everyone out, make every who howler, make every who shout, make every who scream. If you don't, every who is going to end up in beetle nut stew. We are here! And down from the dust speck. The scared little mare. We are put, here. Put a big meeting in the Hoover Town Square. We are and these here. People cried loudly. They cried out in fear. We are here. 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 The elephant smiled. That is clear as a bell. The kangaroo surely heard that very well. All I heard, snapped the big kangaroo, was a breeze and the faint sound of wind through the far distant trees. I heard no small voices, and you didn't either. And the young kangaroo in her pouch said, Me neither. Grab him, they shouted, and cage the big goat, lasso his stomach ten miles of rope, Tie the knot so tight he'll never shake loose. Then don't plant a speck in the bezel nut juice. Horton fought back with great vigour and vim, but the Wickersham gang was too many for him. They beat him, they mauled him, they started to howl him into the cage, but he managed to call the mare. Don't give up, I believe in you all. A person's a person, no matter how small. And you very small persons will not have to die if you make yourselves hid. So come on now and try. <laughs> The mayor grabbed a tom-tom, he started to smack it, and all over Hoover, they hooked up a racket. They rattled tin kettles, they beat on brass pans, on garbage pan tops, and on cranberry cans. They blew on bazookas and glassed great toots, on clarinets, oompas, and boompas, and flutes. Guests of loud racket rag high through the air. They rattled and shook the whole sky. And the mare called up through the howling mad hollow balloon. Horton, how's this? Is our sound coming through? And Horton.
Milton called back. I can hear you just fine, but the kangaroo's ears aren't quite strong quite as mine. They don't hear a thing. Are you sure all the boys are doing their best? Are all making noise? Are you sure every hoo down in the is working? Quick, look through the town. Is anyone shirking? Through the town rushed the mare, from the east to the west, but everyone seemed to be doing their best. Everyone seemed to be yapping or yipping. Everyone seemed to be beeping or bipping. But it wasn't enough. All his ruckus and roar, he had to find someone who helped to make more. He raced through each building, he searched from floor to floor. And he just felt like he was getting nowhere and almost about to give in to disappear and suddenly burst through a door and that mare. A very small, very small shirker named Jojo was just standing, just standing and bouncing a yo-yo. Not making a sound, not a yip, not a chirp. And the mayor rushed inside and grabbed the young twerp. And he climbed with the land, the Eiffelberg Tower. This, cried the mayor, is the town's darkest hour. This is for all those who have blood that is red to come to the aid of the country, he said. We've got to make the noises in greater amounts. So open your mouth, Slag, for every voice counts. Thus he spoke as he climbed. When they got to the top, the lad cleared his throat and he shouted out, Yup! Yup! And that yup, that one small extra yup put it over. Finally, at last, from that speck on that clover, the voices were heard. They rang out in clear and clear, and the elephant smiled. Do you see what I mean? <laughs> they proved they are persons, no matter how small. The whole world was safe by the smallest of all. How true! Yes, how true! said the bean kangaroo. And from now on, you know what I'm planning to do? From now on, I'm going to protect them away from you. And the young kangaroo in her pouch said, Me too. From sun in the summer, from rain when it's foolish, I'm going to protect them no matter how smallish. <laughs>